Well, for those of you who thought we looked like news anchors last time, <laughs> welcome to our morning show. This is Today Around the Boat. I'm your host, Nick, and this is my co-anchor, Megan. And we're on our new set <laughs> in Sign Clarity. Yeah, we should talk about this set maybe a little bit uh, next episode. Next episode, we're going to talk about what, how much we spent and what steps we made to redo this entire salon. It was a makeover. <laughs> it's ready for HGTV. It is. Actually, it was really, really cool. Uh, we spent, I think, one-sixth or so what it would cost to have it done professionally. So yeah, we did a makeover and we'll talk about it step by step should next we, time. Should we tell them what we saved? A lot. <laughs> Thousands. Well, what's the subject of today's video? This is our catamaran versus monohull discussion slash argument part two. <laughs> uh, a lot of you uh, wrote in the comments and some emails with some very valid criticisms of our discussion of cat versus monohull. Stuff that we didn't discuss previously, we probably should have discussed, but didn't. I don't know why. I, you know, I think partially is the video that we did was 30 minutes. We yes. We're trying to be concise, but I think people brought up some really good points. And maybe so. we didn't think about things enough, too. I mean, we literally were in the midst of 10 boat projects, said, hey, let's do a catamaran versus monohull debate. Sure. And we put it together right uh, right quick. But uh, yeah. yeah, some really good things that we didn't think about before we're going to talk about today. So we got our whiteboard out again. Yes, because we love our high-tech graphics. Dum, dum, dum. Part to do. Cat versus monohull. And I hope from last time you got the sense that while we have a catamaran now, we've had three previous monohulls, and... While there's a lot of benefits to having a catamaran, they don't win out in every case for everybody. It really depends on what your budget is and what you want to do with the boat. For example, if you're only doing part-time, maybe in high latitudes, it may make a lot of sense just to get a, a monohull and skip the catamaran. But uh, let's hit some issues we didn't last time. Well, and I also think it's interesting to point out that we actually had a 46-foot monohull and a 46 foot catamaran. So we do have some real apples to apples on that front. I that, think so. A lot of people asked about comparing the, you know, the size to a monohull and what the equivalency. We'll talk more about that. Yeah. So what are the three or four major topics we're going to cover today? We've got safety, redundancy, and speed. Right. And all these are kind of intertwined. Okay, so safety goes to... The catamaran. Uh, a lot of you brought up really valid points, the age-old discussion about uh, the fact that when a catamaran flips over, it doesn't right itself like a monohull does, which is a valid criticism. But I gotta say that capsize, the fear of capsize, whether you're on a monohull or a catamaran, of course it's a concern, but it's really not something that you think about a whole lot. Because mostly you're trying to avoid those really, really bad weather situations. You can see the thunderstorms coming during the day, uh, and at night you've got radar, you can see them coming, and you always reef at night anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but you just don't think about it all that much. What is of much greater concern on a monohull or a catamaran are things like man overboard or injury, uh, or a medical emergency. Uh, things that we haven't necessarily experienced ourselves. So those are the things we hear about happening. We don't ever meet anybody that's capsized. No. So the more common ones, as you said, man overboard. We know somebody who had a Leopard 46 who fell overboard. Right, and lucky to get back on board. Yeah, your grandfather had a heart attack on the way to Tahiti. That's true, yeah. He survived. <laughs> he did. He made it through. Um, so things like medical emergencies and man overboard are much bigger concern day to day. And I got to say that on a catamaran, because you're sailing mostly flat, you're not healing over, I think, given our experience, you're at less risk for falling overboard. Mm -hmm. If there is a medical emergency, you've got flat surfaces to work on. Um, and you mentioned the threat of lightning. That's something that is actually of greater risk on a catamaran. We don't know why, 
but catamarans are hit more often statistically than monoholes. But we know folks with catamarans that have been struck, and we know folks with monoholes that have been struck. And it happens a lot more than you'd uh, expect, I think. It makes me think of that time in St. Augustine when we were on a mooring ball and in the biggest lightning storm, and a monohull got struck and towed away right away. Yeah, maybe they hit the through hole or something yeah. like that. Maybe to say a little bit more about capsize. All right, not all catamarans are designed the same and not all catamarans are, have the same stability and riding moment. These big displacement catamarans, the Leopards, the Fontaine Pajot, the Lagoons, the heavier boats, they are so stable that what's most likely gonna happen is that you're gonna lose the mast, you're gonna lose the rig before the boat actually flips over. Mm -hmm. Performance boat like a Chris White design or an Outremer or a gunboat or a Shoning, much lighter boats that go faster, they are at a greater risk of capsize. So heavier boats, probably gonna lose the rig before you flip the thing over. That's a good point. Yeah. I also like the fact that this boat actually sailed from South Africa. It's true, so. it's true. I think when it comes to safety of one design over another, what matters a whole lot more is the crew running the boat. Now uh, these leopard catamarans, this boat was delivered on its own hull from South Africa. They're routinely delivered in the Southern Ocean, high latitude sailing, big, big swells, big, big winds. So they're certainly safe. It just depends on whether the crew aboard has the experience to keep that boat safe. So, yeah. All right. So cat gets safety. All right, so the next topic is redundancy. Yeah. Sorry, Monohall. We don't have to explain much <laughs> here. Uh, but you know, it does give you a lot of peace of mind to know that you got two engines. Mm -hmm. You've got two different diesel tanks. You've got uh, two of just about everything. Two hot water heaters and on and on and on that the Monohall does not have. Uh, off the top of your head, can you remember how many times we have lost engines in our Monohalls or transmissions close in to shore? Is it five? It's got to be four or five, five times where for a variety of reasons the transmission stopped working or the engine quit when we were very close to other high-priced vessels. Yeah, that's quite a drill. I think it was five times. I think it's so. Each time resulted in some other sort of embarrassment. One time you went <laughs> overboard. Uh, we definitely hit the dock uh, with one of our boats. Uh, actually, a couple different times we hit the dock. Yeah. We had a pretty good clip. So we haven't had any major, major malfunctions on this boat, knock on wood. But we've had two incidents worth noting. Right after we bought the boat, um, we lost oil pressure. We lost all the oil from our starboard engine as we were approaching the bridge at in St. Martin. We thought we were going to head out through this bridge. Just as we get up to it, an ambulance comes up to the bridge. And it closes in front of us. So we had shut down the engine, everything was okay, we were operating on one engine, but now we had to turn <laughs> towards the mega yachts. Oh Steve Jobs' God. boat was sitting right there, I don't know how many billions of dollars that thing cost. Uh, and we've also lost uh, an alternator one time on the port side engine. We lost some of our charging capacity. So in these cases, it's really nice to know that we've got the other engine, the other system mm -hmm. that we can rely on. Uh, whereas in the monohull, you lose your engine, your transmission, you better be a really good sailor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next um, category is speed. Speed. So we're giving that to the catamaran. Obvious reasons there. Yeah, it's really hard to compare apples to apples and oranges right. to oranges on boats because there are plenty of monohulls out there that would destroy this catamaran. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you hear the mouth breather out there? <laughs> Sugar's right outside the door. Doing well, by the way. Uh, but there's lots of monoholes that will perform better than this cat. But I think in general, 
for any length boat, any price point, you're mostly going to find that the catamarans are faster. Yeah. They just are. Of course, you overload them, mm -hmm. you're going to lose all that performance. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't sail them well, mm -hmm. you're going to lose all that performance. So again, really, it's the sailors and the crew That's that true. makes the biggest difference. But speed is definitely a factor. Yeah. Which goes back into safety, mm -hmm. because the faster you can go, the more you can get out of the way of bad weather. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get to a safe anchorage easier. So one other subject that many of our viewers brought up, which was absolutely worth considering, which we didn't previously talk about, and that is high latitude sailing. Not everybody hangs out in the tropics. A lot of <laughs> folks like to get up into where it's cold. Wow. Us, but a lot of people do. And that begs the question, which kind of boat, catamaran or monohull, is better for high latitude sailing? Say you want to go down to Punta Arenas, Chile, or Antarctica, or Greenland, which boat's better? Well, for high latitude sailing, I'm going to go with the metal boat. And I think that means monohull. Yeah, you don't find very many <laughs> steel catamarans out there. I'm sure once somebody built a steel catamaran at some point. Um, and there are a few aluminum catamarans. I could see a cat being better for high latitude stuff just because you would have more sunlight and visibility from inside the boat. But there are just so few metal catamarans out there. So if you're doing high latitude work, I think it makes the most sense to go with a monohull. Um, my uncle, who runs a charter boat out of Prince William Sound, out of Valdez, he chose a big steel monohull. And this is a guy who's been to Antarctica and led expeditions into the Pacific and the South Atlantic. If he chooses a metal boat for high latitude work, yeah, I think that's what we that's should That's a cool boat. Do. How wide is that? Oh gosh, it's got to be 18 or 20 feet. 83 foot monohull. And you can charter it. Yeah, yeah Aurelia Valdez. Charters. Yeah. Check them out. We'll put a link on it. We should. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, there are obstacles in the water in high latitudes. It's not just ice, but uh, deadheads mm -hmm. uh, floating maybe just an inch or two above the water, maybe just at the water line and uh, you don't want to bump into those at speed in a fiberglass boat you'll do a lot of damage potentially yeah so we wanted to talk about some of the other great criticisms and comments that we heard on this video and the first one i think we should mention is the apples to apples and you know if we spent what 350 on a catamaran what could we get 350 wise for a monohull yeah, and would that be a 60 foot monohull, for example? Yeah, I think a, a lot of folks were trying to say that we didn't quite make a fair comparison because we weren't comparing at price points right. and we weren't comparing at square footage. And I think some of those criticisms are valid, but also you have to, I think you have to take into account the, the aim we had with this video, which was to say, that mm -hmm. not every boat is right for every person all the time. Mm -hmm. Each have their pluses and minuses. But let's talk a bit about that, uh, that what you get bang for the buck sort of issue. Yeah, and I want to say I don't have experience sailing a 60-foot monohull, but our friend in St. Augustine had a 65-foot monohull, gorgeous boat. He's working on every inch of it. And just standing on that, you know, the stern of that boat looking out towards the bow i i was like there's no way i would feel comfortable ever sailing this That's i would need problem. a crew absolutely so for two people going out sailing i feel like 46 is sort of the top of the you know the lengthwise that i'm comfortable with right so if you say that this leopard 46 has about the same interior space or usable space as a 65 foot monohull your point is Good luck just running that with a couple. A 65-foot monohull is a huge, huge rig. Gigantic sails, winches this big around. So you think a, a, a him and her team is going to be able to run that boat? Yeah, absolutely if you've got a lot of experience, but it's, it's mainly a job for a big crew. So it's really hard to say that a big monohull is the same sort of thing yeah. as a, as a moderate-sized catamaran. What about when it comes to the dollar figures? 
So, Nick, if we had 300000 to spend on a cat versus a monohull, mm -hmm. what would you do? So you're trying to make an apples to apples comparison just based on the dollar figure. Okay, you have to keep in mind this is based on our scenario, which is we live on this thing full time and we're mostly in the tropics. But if you said, okay, the budget is, let's say, $350,000, $400,000 about what this boat is worth, I'm going to choose the catamaran. And it's mostly because of the livability, the speed, the redundancy, all the things that we've talked about in this video and in the previous video. You start scaling that budget back a little bit more and it gets a little closer, a little harder to decide. What would you choose if the budget was 200000 So think about the boats that are available at 200000 Maybe a Leopard 38 mm -hmm. or a 45 to 50 foot monohull. There's lots of brands out there, Genos, Benetos, uh, that you can get the $150,000 range, which one would you choose? I think I would still go for the catamaran. Yeah, so you'd choose like a, a Lagoon 380 or a Leopard 38 over a mid 40s to 50 foot monohull. Yeah, how about I'm you? with you. Yeah. I think the livability, the fact that you're not you're not uh, rolling, which we've done so much of in our other monohulls, the fact that you get that livability, it's still worth it to me. At two hundred thousand, and that back. again is for full-time living. So let's scale it back. Let's say that the budget is a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. What are you going to choose? Uh, at a hundred thousand dollars, in terms of catamarans, you're looking at a Gemini, kind of older Gemini one hundred five, a mid thirty-foot catamaran, maybe one of the old Cadillacs, something like that. Or at a hundred thousand dollars. You can get a Peterson 44, you can get a more modern classic plastic. Which one would you choose? I think that's pretty obvious. I would get the monohull. Yeah, 100 grand, I think that you get more bang for your buck with a monohull. Yeah. So what you lose out on, which is all the space and comfort, you get in the fact that you can actually afford to go. Yeah. So. And maybe that more aesthetic, you know, that more beautiful wood, you know, monohull feel versus. Yeah. Yeah, a cheaper catamaran. Trimarans. Now that came up a bit in the comments. Very interesting. I wish we could do a comparison. Cat versus mono versus trimaran. <laughs> maybe someday. But we don't have any experience on the trimaran. I would love to go for a ride on a trimaran. We met two Neil 45s mm -hmm. in our cruises, uh, which is a modern trimaran. And both of those owners we're talking about really, really fast passage times. Yeah. I mean, averaging 10, 11, 12 knots over five or six mm -hmm. days, just amazing. Um, and, and they were really cool looking boats. They were really cool, different looking yeah. boats. Um, but that's it in terms of our experience with yeah. trimarans. You just don't even see them out there very often. No, you but really they, don't. They do look really cool. Yeah. Maybe we need to look into that. <laughs> okay, I'm into it. I mean, there's a reason that all these round the world racers are on trimarans and not catamarans. Another thing that uh, people asked was about going upwind and would a catamaran do better if it had deep dagger boards? Yes, yes. Uh, what you get with dagger boards is you get upwind performance. Um, that's absolutely true. So the katanas, the ultramares, what else has them? Uh, the Shonings, um, a lot of one-off boats have dagger boards, the HH, the gun boats, all those fast boats go to windward better. What I tried to explain in our last Cat vs. Mono video though was that the percentage of time that you end up going upwind is really, really small. I don't care if you're on a monohull, a catamaran with dagger boards or fixed keels. Gentlemen, as they say, which it's a bad saying, but mm -hmm. gentlemen don't sail to weather. And gentle women. And gentle women. <laughs> because it doesn't matter whether you're on a fast boat or a slow boat, going upwind involves pounding into the waves and people try and avoid it. So the whole does your cat go upwind is it's kind of academic. It's for bragging rights because in reality, most most sailors just 
try not to go up, upwind because it's so exhausting. And those boats you mentioned, or we mentioned, are very light boats. And I would rather have a heavier displacement catamaran. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, two of the boats that we surveyed in the buying process, one was an Outremer 55, which I think weighs something over half of what this one does. And then a Shoning 49, another ultra light displacement, super duper fast boat. But even in really light conditions, the ride was, it was jerky. I never get seasick. Not I, prone to seasickness. Yeah, not at all. And honestly, I was, it was light conditions from Catalina to San Diego and I couldn't be in the salon. I had to be up at the helm and I was just doing everything I could to breathe and like not feel like throwing up. I just, it was the weirdest like you know, like a bobblehead. Yeah, so light boats. I mean, you better have a pretty strong constitution. So when it comes to this, do dagger boards allow you to perform better sort of questions? Like, well, yes, they do. But for most of us who are cruising full time, mm -hmm. you're gonna be looking for windows in which you don't have to pound up wind. Yeah. Another topic that people brought up was a single handing. That's and right. Nick has some experience with this uh, on our 33-foot monohull. I think just because it's just the two of us on board, anytime one of us is off watch, the other person is single-handing. I mean, I've done true single-handing offshore with our last boat, and I've never taken this boat anywhere of any great distance solo. Um, but I would say overall, I would feel more comfortable going solo on this boat on a catamaran than a monohull just because you've got that stability mm. and it's easier to rest. Redundancy too. Redundancy too. Mm -hmm. When something goes wrong, you still got that other thing you can rely on. I agree. Um, but we got lots and lots of comments on this video. Uh, incredible engagement from folks. Thank and you. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. So fun to interact with you. So that's our wrap up of the cat versus monohull debate. Number two. <laughs> Let the abuse begin. <laughs> no, we really do appreciate everybody's comments, uh, whether it's positive or negative. We by no means want to pretend that we are the experts in terms of all boats or all catamarans versus all monohulls. This is just based on our own experience. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't, go back and watch the previous video, the cat versus monohull video. And I think you'll see that we were trying to be uh, unbiased and fair and really explain that it depends on your budget and what you're gonna do with the boat as to which boat is better. Yes, I agree. And if you enjoy listening to us talk, we do Who have doesn't? a podcast called Under the Sheets. Yeah, it's a little different than this. We try and make these videos somewhat topical. Um, whereas other sailing channels maybe talk more about their day-to-day -day life and their lifestyle. And we like to get a little bit more personal in the podcast where yeah. we just kind of ramble on and tell you what's going on with us in our, in our life and our sailing life and, and the rest of it. And it's a little bit more intimate. It's kind of, kind of fun. So check that out. It's on iTunes and Stitcher. And uh, yeah, sign up for that and you'll get the latest episode every time we make a new one. And I do have my own YouTube channel you can check out too under Megan O'Kelly. You should definitely go check it out. It's uh, it's really cool content, and it's different than what you're going to find here. What are some of the some of the topics? You're well, I cover? just did a Final Cut Pro editing how to actually put videos on YouTube. So a little walkthrough. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have that as an excuse on why you're not doing it. <laughs> yes. Also, it's very motivational. I really like the topics that you're Thank covering. You. Yeah. Well, I'm actually going to I'm interviewing Nick for the next video on how how to do a good video. Because well, he's, I mean, <laughs> he's got videos that have 360,000 views, so I think it's going to be a good interview. Well, I hope so. <laughs> now you got high standards for me to live up to. Uh, yeah, thank you everybody for joining us, and uh, we really appreciate all your comments, all your suggestions. We read each and every uh, comment. If you'd like to sign up for our private Facebook group, we try and do more and more there. Some, again, more behind-the-scenes stuff, a little bit more interactive. <laughs> See you next time. See ya.